Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About the Middle East. I'm Andy Blanche. And I'm Juliana Mishaev, and John Dickman is here helping us with the soundboard today. On this show, we talk about the Middle East. It's culture, politics, history, religion, just about anything that captures the complexity of the region. We hope to promote open and honest discussion about the conflict in Israel and Palestine and to humanize the conflict by getting to know people who have a stake in the issues. You're listening to WSLR 96.5 LPFM in Sarasota and WBPV 100.1 LPFM in Bradenton. The opinions and views expressed on Let's Talk About the Middle East are strictly those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of the station manager, the board of directors, or anyone else affiliated with WSLR. Big brothers and big sisters are needed. Please take a moment to visit the Big Brother Big Sister website. It only takes one hour a week to make a difference in the life of a child. For more information, contact Lay Wilcox at smh.com. That's L E I G H hyphen W I L C O X at smh.com or call 941 917 6693. Today, we're pleased to have in the studio with us Robert DeWarren. Uh, he lives here in Sarasota, and over his very long career, he's been a classical and contemporary ballet dancer, a director, choreographer, educator, and an archivist of Persian tribal dance and music. He lived in Iran for 11 years in the 60s and 70s. That was before the Iranian Revolution. And he was a personal friend of the Shah's. He is currently director of the Sarasota International Dance Festival and Iran Das, a project attempting to preserve the cultural traditions of tribal Iran. We're hoping today that Robert will be able to give us some deeper insight into the history and culture of Iran, a country that is often stereotyped and even demonized here in the West. Thank you so much for joining us today, Robert. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate being invited and discussing a subject uh, very dear to my heart and life experience. Well, we're really looking forward to it. So let's start with a personal question. Robert, you're English. Your wife, who you met in South America, is French. You've been a dancer, a director, a choreographer, a cultural historian. You were friends with Rudolf Nureyev, and you're friends with the Shah of Iran and his wife. Is there any common theme to this incredibly varied life? What's your secret for finding so many absolutely fascinating opportunities? You know, I've asked myself so many times this same question because I never did a conscious effort to do what I did, but amazingly, either people who I worked with, like Ninette Devalois, founder of the Royal Ballet, uh, Rudolf Nureyev, people like that whom I got to know well, uh, would arrange for doors to open. And, and it was at a time in which my life needed a change, and these doors opened. So when I couldn't dance anymore at 29, uh, Madame, as we called Devalois, the founder of the Royal Ballet, where I'd been a dancer and, and budding choreographer, said, I'm sending you to Iran. And the funny thing was, was that I'd met the Shah because he was a constant visit to London and to the royal family. And, uh, and so I, I'd met him on stage. They would always bring the guests of the crown to meet the artists. And so I was fascinated by this man because he was so totally European, spoke perfect <laughs> English and perfect French. And I thought, well, Iran must be rather like Monte Carlo or something, you know, exotic but rich. And of course it wasn't. When we arrived, it was the surprise of my life. And uh, uh, Jacqueline and I had to really adapt very quickly to this new mentality and, of course, the language problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. So basically it sounds like you have just stayed open to wherever your work and your passion has led you, and it's just naturally led you to some pretty interesting places in life. Yes, yeah. I think that people feel, because I, I'm not a person who's self uh, centered in a way, and I'm not a person who lives in the past. I'm always uh, fascinated by new developments, even to this day. I mean, I love hip hop and street dancing, and I've worked with Little Buck, the black dancer from Nashville who, who did the dying song with Yori Ma, you know. So <laughs> when you have these opportunities to contrast cultures, it fascinates me. And so I went for three years and I stayed 11. 
So, in years that you lived in Iran, uh, how did you end up going there, and what was Iran like at the time? And then also, you knew the Shah personally, so from your personal experience, what kind of man and leader was he? Well, it was very interesting because he was very uh, socially graceful when we met him. You know, he had very great charm. But arriving in Iran, of course, I had no idea what Tehran. I'd never been to either Egypt or any other part of the world near the, the Middle East or the Near East. And so it was a total surprise. I was first of all impressed by the gentleness of the people and how concerned they were for our well-being and not only super, superficial polite, but actually sincerely wanting to know if we needed anything. And it was really very impressive. And, you know, they have a what they call tarof, which is a code of ethics in society that is so uh, really established and it is so welcoming. If you happen to say, like Jacqueline would make a mistake and say to an Iranian lady, oh, that brooch is beautiful, she took it off <laughs> and gave it to her. So I had to train her not to make, because she is very observant of fashion and things. So, you know, this this is an example of, of the mentality of the country I was going in. And then, of course, because I was there uh, for the Minister of Culture and Art, who was the brother-in-law to the Shah, he was married to the Shah's elder sister, he was also a musician and perfect English, like the Shah. He was educated in, in Europe and France, and his English was that of an Englishman. And so we, we became very... Um, very uh, close because he sensed in me a curiosity and I think that's what really opened the doors that we were talking about uh, a minute ago that it was my curiosity for humanity and its behavior and and, uh, and the arts as expressions of the human soul, you know, so that's what really enthralled me and, and made me appreciate and then want to learn more about the country itself and not the hot hothouse atmosphere of the ballet company which is totally European you know, at the opera house. So I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but there we are. <laughs> well, let's um, let's go with the Shah a little bit. Um, the narrative, common narrative in this country, is that the Shah was a, was the CIA created a coup and they installed the Shah as a friend of the United States, and that in fact he was a brutal dictator who locked people up at the at his whim and tortured them. And the Savak was famous. That's a pretty common narrative here. Do you think that's accurate? Well, no. And because I lived there eleven years, I can tell you it wasn't accurate. But uh, the 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 CIA helped to reinstate state uh, the Shah to the throne after Mossadegh, who was his actually tutor as a child, and then became prime minister and and abolished the Shah, the royal, the, the monarchy, because he wanted to nationalize the oil and put Iran on the map for the things it could do for the rest of the world. I mean, oil at that time, and even today, is a very important element of our economies, you know. And so the Shah was helped to get back to the throne. And, of course, his father had left when the British and the Russians invaded Iran uh, because they were afraid of the nationalization of the oil. So uh, the Reza Shah had gone to South Africa, where he died. But his son, when he came back after being reinstated by the CIA, he really started to feel his responsibility of the nation in every sense. And so he started to implement uh, proper economic reforms. He created the White Revolution, which didn't spill one blood of dro a drop of blood, you know. And that was really dividing the land gentry's wealth because people there owned, uh, you know, like we had an estancia in Argentina of 75,000 acres. Well, they had 150,000 acres. So it was like a province. And, uh, and that couldn't go on if you were going to modernize the country. So his efforts were to make Iran self-sufficient. And that didn't fit in with either the uh, United States or Britain economic views because they wanted to retrieve the oil for their own exploitation.
And actually, Mohammad Reza Shah, he actually founded OPEC, which was the, the, the whole organization that could control the prices of oil mm -hmm. of the international market. And, and so, you know, I knew him very well, and he was a gentleman. He was not a persecutor. He was not a dictator. He was absolutely extraordinary. And I, I can say that not because I'm biased, but because he won me over with this sincerity. Because when I would come back from research, he would ask, to talk to me and he said what did you find and I never had escorts anywhere you know so I can't say that the picture the West has had and has has anything to do with reality it has more and do, uh, to do with uh, ambition <laughs> uh -huh. and expropriation of, of uh, you know national uh, national treasures so while we're on this theme um, we currently today think of Iran as a place where women have few rights and are very oppressed. What was the position of women in society during the time that you were there, during the Shah's regime? Well, the Shah, you know, of course, being educated in Europe, and then his wife, uh, Farah Pahlavi, Farah Diba, she was uh, the daughter of a colonel, and she was uh, educated at La Sorbonne in Paris. She was an architect and a, stu a student of, of art. And so, you know, her mission was to revive the arts in the country, give them proper places in perfect museums where, you know, the, the millennia of Iranian culture could be seen not only by Iranians but by foreigners. And as you know, for centuries people have going, I mean, famous <coughs> writers have been to Iran to study their culture because we've inherited that culture which has helped us move forward in our lives, you know. So I think that if one has an open mind, and I'm not a politician, I'm very sensitive to issues that concern humankind. And so when I was on, on research into, uh, you know, outlandish little valleys in the middle of all the mountains, that's why the tribes didn't mix, because they lived so isolated from each other. I, I'd be welcomed by the chieftain of this tribe, who was like a small shah in proportion. He was, you know, life and death over his own people. But the people were humble, but you walked into at that time in the 70s is a sort of um, mud and straw hut, and, and the family lived there, but there was a refrigerator, you know, because that was what they could have for what they needed, cold water and preservation of nourishment. So all these things made me have a very complete view of a civilization that in the West we have no idea. And women were free. He abolished the use of the chador. They could wear a little rusari, which was just covering the hair around the face, but it wasn't obligatory. In regional and provinces they did that, but in Tehran it was like a western capital. Mini skirts were even minier than they were in Paris, you know. So, I mean, it was Christian Dior among society, but everybody had a great sense of, of style when they dressed. It was very impressive. And of course, when Khomeini invaded and, and he just went back to medieval concepts of Islam, because that's the problem. When you go back to the oranges of a religion, like you do with Catholicism and Islam and so many other religions, the violence was propagating the, the, the religion with violence. But later on, and particularly in Iran, because they're a very different uh, race, they're not uh, Arabic, they're Aryan, and they have a philosophy of life that has been with them for centuries, that you accept other beliefs and civilizations. So in Iran, even in the time of, of Xerxes and Darius, you know, uh, before B. C. Uh, you know, he welcomed these people to the courts, and they were all part of the civilization that was growing. Whereas Alexander the Great went there and killed everybody to put the Greek on top. So it was a different theology as well. You know. So it sounds like during that um, during that period. Um, women had rights, they could dress as they wanted to, and they tended to look to the West for their cultural norms. So they were following fashion, they were getting education. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was quite a step backward for women um, after oh, the revolution. Oh, absolutely, because, you know, they, they worked, uh, they were actually, the minister of education was a woman, and she was brilliant. Of course, Khomeini cut her head off immediately. Right. You, uh, you were there one year before the revolution. Could you talk to us a little bit about why it happened, what was underneath the turmoil, 
And also, what role did the U.S. and other Western countries play? Well, it was very much a politically arranged coup. I mean, uh, it's hard for people to believe that people, the West could access Khomeini, but Khomeini, actually, the Shah spared his life because he was having plots trying to have the Shah murdered. And the Shah actually uh, had said, you must exile him, and he was afraid his generals would actually execute him, and they didn't. He said, you wrap him in a, in a big rug and you, you fly over the border into Iraq and let him there. And so he should have been grateful that he, he was alive. And, uh, and then, for some reason, he ended up in Paris creating a whole center for the new Iran Islamic uh, system he wanted to impose if he was going to be a, a ruler. And they helped, you know, financially. They would instigate by sending back Iranian and mullahs and religious and people who had already been indoctrinated to pay for communities to demonstrate. And even when I was in America during the Bicentennial, uh, as a representative of Iranian culture, we danced for the, pr the White House, President Ford, and all over the country. I saw the results of people being paid to create havoc during my performances, and I was actually violently attacked once. So for me, there was a, a, a whole machinery in motion to get the Shah out, because he was a very just re le leader, but he wasn't flexible regarding the national resources of the country he owned, you know, because he was like the father. And one thing I'd like to add is that none of the civilizations in the Middle East and even more towards the East could be uh, stable if they didn't have a very strong head of state, whether it be a tyrant, a dictator like Saddam Hussein. Uh, the biggest mistake was to remove him because now it's total chaos and it will only take somebody equivalent to that man to get that country back into some sort of discipline. It's a terrible thing for me to admit, but the mentality is such that they don't respect, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, benevolent rule. They have to be forced to obey, otherwise they're going to go to the extremes that Khomeini has brought back with his medieval theory of, of, the, of how Islam should be performed, you know. Totally interesting. So, um, since the 70s, since the revolution, uh, Iran has been controlled by Islamic authorities, clerical authorities, and, and we tend to think of it as a Muslim society, which it is. Um, but of course, Iranians are Persian, they're not Arabs, which we tend to forget. The Persian culture is ancient and made many, many, many contributions to civilization. Oh, yeah. um, they were originally Zoroastrians, so the, um, the Islam has been layered over a very deep, um, very different tradition. Can you talk to us a little bit about Persian culture, what it has given humanity, and some things that we ought to know about uh, Iranians as Persians? Yes. Well, they are, of course, from Aryan, uh, you know, from Central Asia. Those were the tribes that settled in, in Fars, which is, that's why it's called Persia, the province of Fars. is a central province, but Iran as a country exists for many, many years. People now tend to think, oh, it was Persia, and then they changed the name to Iran. That's not true. It was always Iran, but the West only felt that pa fa uh, Fars, Pars, Persia was the, the region they ran recognize because some of the bit better shahs live there. But, I mean, it's a different race altogether, and they're a very lyrical and intellectual race. And so, as I said earlier, the rulers didn't kill their enemies. They absorbed them, and they gave them the possibility to make contributions to, to society. So if you look at Persepolis, which was the height of the Achaemenian em Empire, there are not like in Greek and Roman temples, you know, and palaces, uh, the rulers trampling their enemies on the ground in sculpture and all of that. There, no. There are stairways with all the ambassadors from different nations coming to pay tribute to, to the Shah of the Shahs, because he allowed every kingdom to remain with its own personal Shah, and he was then the Shah of the Shahs, mm. which is the 
title that uh, that Muhammad Reza Shah assumed when he crowned himself. But I think it's interesting to note that he didn't crown himself until he felt the country was in a position and he had an heir to the throne and he wasn't a guy who was after, you know, all this pomp and ceremony, but he wanted to do it to impress the world on exactly what you asked me about, the ancient culture of that nation. So there are contributions to medicine by from Avicenna, who, who, who was actually, uh, well, his knowledge was taught in Europe until the mid-19th century, and then modern medicine took over, but those were the basis of medicine in those years, and that's just one of many, because uh, human rights, the code of human rights was written by Darius the Great for all the people that lived under his throne. So it isn't only the Magna Carta in England, you know, it started way before. <laughs> so I think the contribution is so enormous. This morning I went online just to see if I could refresh my mind. There were a hundred entries on the contributions of Iranian culture to the world, you know. Not to mention their food. Oh, tell me about <laughs> it, yes. Well, that's another myth. You see, people think that Iranian cuisine is like Pakistani or Indian or like Arab cuisine, and it's not. It's very, very sober. There are not a whole lot of spices and a lot of oils and things like that. I mean, the real kebab comes from Iran, and it's just grilled vegetables on a plate of boiled steamed rice, which has nothing in it, and then you put a French, a, a, a lump of butter and an egg yolk on top, and a few uh, sort of herbs, dried herbs, and that's your main course. I mean, there, there's nothing there that's toxic or bad for health, you know. And the yogurt is fantastic. <laughs> When you were in Iran, you got involved in a project documenting the wide range of traditional tribal music, dance and ceremonies from all over the country. Tell us about that experience. What happened to the collection, and are you continuing the work today? How are you continuing it? Well, I am, because I can't afford to let that uh, be lost. You know, when I started with the ballet, as I said, it was a hothouse atmosphere, but they wanted, and we had Margot Fontaine and Nureyev and all companies like Bejar, Alvin Ailey. And then, you know, I would see through gateways these beautiful Persian gardens with the tiles and the water and the roses and the palace of Golestan is the Palace of the Roses, where the the, the, the coronation took place and I became very interested and the minister said to me, Mr. Warren I see that you'd like to get to know us more and I said yes, I'm happy to do the ballet but can you let me travel and so at the beginning he organized a, a troop of people to help me go out into the regions with interpreters and, and technicians for filming and sound recording and cameras and little by little I could master it so I would take two, two dancers from the college of the institute I formed because as a result of my research, the Shah and the Empress said we must organize the National Folklore Society and we created a college, a three-year degree course for graduates of high school that came in from the regions and had the tribal background. So we chose them from all over the country and they were very well educated, you know. In fact, I must say, when I arrived, illiteracy was more than uh, 65 to 70 percent and when I left 11 years, it was down to 15% of illiteracy. I mean, that My, is enormous. That's huge. And when the Shah did the, the celebration of the 2,500 years at Persepolis, for which he was condemned, it was because he wanted to show the history of the country, but people didn't put in print in the Times anywhere on television that he paved 2,500 kilometers of roads. He opened 2,500 medical clinics. He opened 2,500 schools, elementary schools, all over the country. It was a campaign to push the education of the nation into this century, you know. But of course, the Muslims who couldn't then control the populace with all the mystique of religion, which we know happens in our religions too, they wanted to get rid of him because they were losing control of the people, and that's what happened. But I did establish all of that, and when I left, I mean, I had copies of all the, what I did in the, in the institute, which have the files of all my research, and I went to every single province, you know. And, and while you were in the provinces, you were filming the tribal dances and yes. ceremonies? 
and recording the music exactly. so that you are actually creating a record exactly. of the tribal cultural practices yes. that were quickly being lost, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, okay, so that's what yes. you're talking about when you talk yes. about the collection. The collection, absolutely. And so I left the collection in the library and in the museum of antique uh, instruments, tribal musical instruments and that, and artifacts, because at weddings they used a lot of different artifacts. I mean, they're fascinating ceremonials. I mean, for me, it was like a kid's dream, you know, like a Boy Scout's dream to be pushed into all these places. And in the end, I didn't have to have people from the ministry. I took two dancers, and we filled, and I would have a, an administrator to help me, and that, that's how we did it. So today, my really big effort is to try and save as much as I can. Fortunately, somebody was able to uh, smuggle out of Iran the whole repertoire that was recorded by Iranian national television. So this is on the web, but then I have some of my own, and I'm always looking to supplement, and I have people who were my students who are now slowly trying to release or giving to family members who travel west to bring to me so that we can create an institute for that. Well, I hope you're successful, because it would just be a shame if that stuff were lost. Oh, absolutely. Forever. Yeah. yeah. So to close up the show, Robert, um, can you talk to our audience about how living in Iran for 11 years changed you as a person? Well, it's, it was from, day, from night to day, let's say, because I was illuminated on what humanity is all about. You know, being a member of the Royal Ballet, very sophisticated royal company at Covent Garden, discipline was all classical. You never looked at modern dance or anything in those days. It was stifling for me because I was already a creator of choreography. And so I would choose themes that were not the normal fairy tales, you know. And so when I went to Iran and I started uh, talking and then I could speak Farsi, and I always had interpreters who spoke the dialect of the languages, I began to understand the wealth of this nation. And then, of course, I went to the museums, and I looked for ancient manuscripts, and I looked, I couldn't read them, but I was fascinated by the sophistication of what they did, and the palaces of the different shahs in, in their own capitals all over the country were works of art. The frescoes in, in Isfahan at the Palace of the Forty Pillars were fascinated, so I recreated created the whole thing in a live performance at the Opera House. And so the good thing was that this was the basis for the repertoire of the Mahali dancers of Iran with which we toured the world. But of course after that I couldn't do it anymore and I was very lucky that in London people remembered me and I was immediately appointed director of the, the uh, Northern Valley Theatre which I took into of course a, a level which was much broader in repertoire than anything else. So thank you so much. This has been a really, really interesting um, uh, interview. We've been listening to Robert DeWarren, who's been sharing his memories of living in Iran before the revolution of 1979. Thank you so much for joining us today, Robert. Is there a way for listeners to reach you or to learn more about your work? Well, my website, Robert at robertdewarren.org, is, you know, has a lot of, of stuff in it. And then anybody can email me at robert at dewarren.org, and I'd be very happy to share knowledge or, or do whatever they would like me to do to help us further this, this wonderful subject. But thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. If you want to learn more about this show, give us feedback or share ideas about topics or speakers, you can find us on Facebook. Just search Let's Talk About the Middle East. If you leave a comment, we'll give you a shout-out on the next show. You can find this interview and others on our YouTube site. Um, I, I want to remind the listeners that Robert DeWarren is offering a series of three lectures at the Ringling Lifelong Learning Academy. The series is titled Master of the Dance to the Imperial Court of Iran, and it will be held on the Tuesday, on Tuesdays from 12.30 to 1.50, starting next Tuesday, June 7th. I think the course is currently fully subscribed, but if enough additional people want to attend, they might move it to a larger room. And there's a chance uh, he'll be able to offer the course again in the future. So if you're interested, call 941-309-5111. Our theme music is from Merkava by the Israeli musician and peace activist Gabby Myers. 
Join us next time. Take care and spread the peace.